Thank you so much to all of you for being here this morning. Tom Rainer, president of Lifeway, did a Twitter survey a couple of years ago on silly things church members fight over. I know y'all want to hear that list, don't you? At least a couple of them. So here's what he found. Arguments over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. Apparently that was an issue for some. Here's one that is very interesting. Church dispute over whether or not to install restroom stall dividers in the women's restroom. Ladies, I'm sorry to say that. It must be designed by a man. A fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. I suggest none, okay? Because no one knows what he looked like. Here's one that was interesting. A disagreement over using the term potluck instead of pot blessing. <laughs> I didn't even know that was an issue. I guess luck is not a Christian thing. So we, pot. I suggest don't use the word pot at all. In the world in which we live, just stay away from pot. Say no to pot. Anyways, today we're going to learn from the Apostle Paul how not to fight in the church, but instead to be partners in ministry, to be partners in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the message is called Partners in our series through Paul's letter to the Philippians. The series is called Grateful, and we are in Philippians chapter 1, and verse 7, let's all stand once again for the reading of God's Word. Paul says, Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. As we go further into this message, you will realize how rich and how deep that prayer, that passage really is. But before we do that, the Philippians were partakers with Paul. They were partners with Paul in sharing the gospel. How do you view yourself? Do you see yourself as partners with others in the body of Christ? Do you see yourselves as partners in the gospel of grace coming through Clearview? This is a convicting message because we are so individualistic. We, we feel like this is my life, my walk, my gift, my service, my ministry. Paul talked about partnership and here's a question I ask every week are you saved before you can be a partner before you can be a participant you have to be a recipient of the gospel before you can partner you have to first receive have you received the gift of God through Jesus Christ are you saved would you bow your heads in prayer Holy Spirit we pray today Make us partners in the gospel. Let that spirit of partnership that we are uh, not just members, but we are partners together in taking the gospel in our community and beyond. And for those who are not partners, those who are not even saved, we pray today, God, open their eyes, their hearts, that they may see Christ crucified for their sins. For it's in his name we pray, let everyone say, you may be seated. Paul's relationship with the Philippians was one of trust, joy, and hope. Now last weekend, if you were here, we learned that Paul had the hope, the solid confidence that what God began in their lives on the first day, he will finish on the day of Jesus Christ. We learned what this really means in Philippians 1 and verse 6, but we also looked at other references in Paul's letters to understand the assurance of the believer. 
that what God begins, he always completes. Salvation from start to finish is God's work of grace, and it's a good work. We may stumble, we may fail, but we cannot take away what God is doing in our lives. It is totally his work, and it's always by grace, and it's always completed. So how should we live? Some people think that if you tell people about the grace of God, that start to finish is his work, people will sin. They will take that as a license to sin. Just the opposite. It's an exhortation to walk in the Spirit. It's an exhortation to grow in grace, to serve in freedom, to be less judgmental of others and even of self, to walk blameless, and to be more grateful to God because it's all His. So it's not a license to sin. To the contrary, it's an assurance that God loves you and in that love, I need to live a life that is pleasing to Him. But Paul, when he says, I am so confident that what God has begun with you, in you, He will complete it, he gives us another reason why he is saying that. I want us to look at that reason in verse 7. We just read this passage. Paul says, just as... It is right for me to think this of you all. He said, the reason I'm telling you that I'm so confident what God began on the first day, he will complete on the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to say this to you. In other words, Paul was not just giving them a platitude. He was not just giving them a cold, lifeless doctrine. He was not just giving them a cheap pep talk. He said, I feel in me that this is right for me to say this to you. Why is it right, Paul? Listen to what he says. Because I have you in my heart. The reason I am so confident that what God began, he will complete, is because I know it's the right thing to say to you because you are in my heart. I love you. When you read Paul's letters, don't just read the words. Pay attention to the emotional undertones and overtones. What many times people mistake is they just read it for doctrine, they just read it flat, letters on a page. When Paul is writing, his emotions are coming through. You have to pay attention to those emotions because they take you deeper into the understanding that Paul is placing behind those words. He says, it is right for me to say this to you because you are in my heart. Uh, Paul is intentional. He is passionate that the Philippians understand that God will finish what he has started because he loves them. He's telling them again and again. I almost picture a parent with a child cupping their face and saying, son, I, I know you can do this. There's a great challenge coming. Maybe it's a sport. Maybe it's an exam. Maybe it's something they have never been through. Cupping their face and saying, I know you can do this. I trust you. Don't worry. You can get this. Paul has that kind of intensity involved when he says, just as it is right for me to think this of you all because you're in my heart. It's because Paul loved them from his heart, he was reminding them of God's best for them from his heart. Now I want you to listen very carefully. When you truly love somebody, it reflects in the way you speak to them your heart comes through when you truly love somebody. When you truly care for someone, when you truly uh, want the best for them, you don't just talk from your head, you also talk from your heart. When you walked in this morning, hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Man, it's raining out there. It's crazy this week. I hope it doesn't snow. I'm telling you, I'm glad it snows. Snow is great. Ice is bad. You know, we, we have this talk from the head. When you truly love somebody, you truly care for them, your heart reaches up and joins your head. So now when you speak, it's not just the head speaking, but it's also the heart coming through. When Paul is writing these words, it's not just his head, it's also his heart. Are you all with me? 
If you ask me what is the vision for Clearview, this is where we need to be. When we speak to each other in the body of Christ, when we speak to one another in the family of God at Clearview, uh, it's not just words from your mouth just coming from your head. It should be a hard conversation. Why? Because you care for them. Because you have them in your heart, your heart is speaking out. Would you agree that people can tell when you genuinely care for them and how you speak to them? Can they tell when you are talking at them, when you just tolerate them? They can tell. Do you have people like that in your life that when they come to you and when they begin to speak with you, they speak with you with intensity, with passion, and you know that this person really cares about me? How do you feel around that person? Just relax. This person has the best in mind for me. That's the relationship the Philippians had with Paul and Paul had with the Philippians. It was a heart relationship. Don't miss the emotions. Read between the lines. How do you relate with each other in this church? Do you really, truly care for one another? This is a very convicting message because as I was preparing, I was saying, <laughs> boy, if the standard is a, you know, a zero and to ten, I'm like in the negatives right now. Now, why did Paul have this kind of tight bond with the Philippians? He tells us, Listen again to that verse. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. The reason Paul and the Philippians had this connection is because they were partakers with each other in grace. In other words, they were partners in the gospel. This was not some superficial relationship because we are members of a church. They were partners in the gospel. They stood with Paul when he was in chains. By the way, that was in an honor and shame culture. That was horrible. We don't think about it, but Paul was in prison. We think, about, man, what a martyr. Back in those days, he is in prison, and he is your chief apostle. <laughs> Would God treat his chief apostle by sending him to a Roman prison? Are you serious? The Philippians were not ashamed of him. They stood with him. When Paul defended the gospel against the Judaizers, uh, the Philippians stood with him. When Paul confirmed the gospel against the world, the Philippians stood with him. There was a bond, there was a partnership in the gospel. I want you to hear me very carefully. In many churches, the bond has nothing to do with the gospel. The bond has to do with your skin pigmentation because we're all of the same skin tone. The bond has to do with your standard of living, how much you make. Do you know many years ago one family left the church because they said that our church was not up to their standard of living? I hear the, here's the funny thing. And I know I'm speaking out of pride. Today, uh, our church is a little higher than their standard of living. Forgive me, Lord. I shouldn't have said that. I was, see, this is, this is why you need to be praying for me as I'm preaching, okay? <laughs> but back in those days, it hurt. It really hurt. I was like, are you? I was like, did they really say that? Yeah, they said it twice. They said, really, because, you know, we just don't, cannot associate with the people at your standard of, of uh, living. But, oh. The church bond is not dependent on which side of the railroad tracks you live on. See, if that is the bond of unity, it will be superficial and it will be unstable. That's why you can see churches that are, it seems like one moment, man, they're amazing, they're growing up. Look, they're attracting all of them of the same type and same job, and they're all yuppies, or they're all young people, and next thing you know, there are problems and things are beginning to happen because that is not the glue that holds the body together. You know what the glue is? Partakers with me of grace. Grace is a synonym for the gospel. 
what unites us together is that we are here to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. There is a much bigger cause at stake, and so we got to get along. We better get along. Are y'all getting this? You know, what is the motto at Clearview? Making Christ visible. What is the goal of our church? To lead all people into a life-changing, ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the goal that brings us together. You take away the gospel, and then the relationships become superficial. They become unstable. Church is not some club. It's not your favorite bar or your hangout. That's why they fight so much at those bars and those hangouts. Amen. And that's why they fight so much at the church. Because they don't realize we are together for something much greater. The Philippians were with Paul for something much greater. It was the gospel. Stay with me. Paul is deep, but we got to get this. Verse 6, for I'm confident that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul, why are you so confident? I'm not telling you just some doctrine. I'm confident it's because I have you in my heart, and it is the right thing for me to say to you. Paul, why is it the right thing for you, me to, for you to say to us? Because I love you deeply. Why do I love you deeply? Because we are partners in the gospel. Because you were with me when I was in chains. You were with me when I was defending the faith. You were with me when I was witnessing to the world. It doesn't stop there. Paul's love for the Philippians continues to overflow. See, if you miss these emotional taglines, you will miss the depth of what he is saying here. Listen to verse 8. He says, for God is my witness. Do you know at this time, Paul is taking an oath? In a sense, he is swearing. <laughs> I, I, I swear to God is what he's saying. I swear to God. If I were to uh, tell Paul at that point, Paul, you know, you, you're not supposed to take God's name in vain. Uh, folks, listen, at this point, he is talking more from his heart than from his head. His heart and head are coming together. This is not taking God's name in vain. What he is doing is telling them, I really, truly want you to get what I'm saying to you. How much I, how much I think about you. Well, how much do you think about us, Paul? God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Now, if you read that with, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus. You missed it. There's some deep pathos in that verse. How greatly I long for you. And the word for affection is the Greek word splankna, which means your vital organs, the noble organs like the heart, the lungs, the liver. That's not the head talking, folks. That's the heart meeting the head and talking through the mouth or coming through the pen. Y'all get it? How he's speaking to them? It's a convicting message for me as a pastor because I hate to admit to you, I don't love you that much. I mean, I love all of you, but I don't love you with my vital organs. Y'all laughing at me? Y'all don't love me the same way either. Would you give your heart to me? Oh, you, no, you won't. <laughs> you will stop answering those texts and the phone calls. It's like, cannot be found, you know. Paul says, I greatly long for you with those vital organs. But if you notice carefully, the affection or the splankna, the organs like the heart, liver, and lungs are not Paul's organs. What does he say? F by the affection of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you are reading this book, you're reading the inspired, inerrant Word of God, but this is a man-mountain who is speaking. Paul is an amazingly rich and deep man who walked very close to God. He says, I love you, but it's not my love. It's the love of Jesus Christ through me. One scholar said it this way. It is not Paul who lives in Paul, but Jesus Christ, which is why Paul is not moved by the organs of Paul, but by the organs of Jesus Christ. 
there will be times that some people will be very difficult to love and you cannot love them. You cannot have this kind of affection and longing for them. But if you let Christ love them through you, all things are possible. And sometimes it is tough, isn't it? Sometimes it is difficult. But if you let the Holy Spirit work in your life, and you pray and you say, God, I can't love them. But I ask you to love them with the vital organs of Jesus Christ, with the affection of Jesus Christ. Then the Holy Spirit said, okay, through you, I will love them with the love of Christ. And that's when the world says, I really don't know how you are so loving and kind. And you don't have this fake, superficial love, this mushy-gushy love that is not real. You have a real love, and the other person feels it. I can guarantee you that many times the Philippians offended Paul. I can guarantee you there were times when the, the Paul offended the Philippians, but the reason they were able to move past that is because of the love of Jesus Christ flowing through Paul. I'm telling you, we're a great church. We're an amazing church. One of our core values is that we are a loving church, but I, I, I'm telling you right now, the bar is way too high. We're not where we need to be. Are we? No. Let's be honest. We're not. I think we're getting there. And as the pastor, I can tell you, I'm in the negatives right now. If zero is the starting point, I'm somewhere way down in the negatives. But all this is more than just emotionalism. Paul says, because of this, because I love you so much, I feel like I need to tell you these things. And what I'm telling you is that God is going to finish what he has begun in your life until the day of Jesus Christ. And our bond is deep. It is because we have been together in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And that I want to be with you. I love you through Christ in me. Let me tell you how I pray for you. And this I pray. That word end is very important because it's not just, okay, so let me talk about prayer time now. No, this is connected to what happened in verse 8. And this I pray. Paul is going back and picking up what he started in verse 4. Remember when in verse 4 he was saying, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Uh, you know, that's why I didn't focus on that much because later on he tells you why he has this joy. Why he has this joy when he play, prays for the Philippians is because he loves them so much. Why does he love them so much? Because they were together in the gospel. And let me say this. This prayer is very important. It is especially important to me as a pastor, but it's also important to you if you are a ministry leader at Clearview. Because this is how you should be praying for your partners in the gospel. If you are a care group leader, pay careful attention to this prayer. If you are a Sunday school teacher, this is how you should be praying for your class. If you are a ministry leader of any capacity, men's ministry, women's ministry, Kindle, Joy, Blaze, Awana, Converge, Illuminate, we have so many ministries bear care uh, this is how you should be praying for your partners in the gospel you say how do we know this is really a pattern of how to pray because all you have to do is compare philippians with colossians and they are identical this is paul's pattern when he prays for those who are partners in the gospel he doesn't have this prayer when he is talking to the corinthians but with the philippians colossians who were his buddies in the gospel, his battle buddies, there is a pattern here. How does it go? And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. The first thing Paul prays for his partners is for love. What kind of love? Love for God. Love for Jesus Christ. A love for those in the ministry. Love for those who are lost. 
Isn't that beautiful? That the place Paul begins is by saying, I'm praying that you will not just have love, but you will have overflowing love. You need so much love in your heart because love will cover a multitude of sins. So when there is bitterness and envy and jealousy and, and, and uh, uh, miscommunication, love will drown all those sins so you can keep doing what you're supposed to do. Love, overflowing. He doesn't stop there. Listen again, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge. What kind of knowledge, Paul? Knowledge of God. Knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowledge of the Word of God. Knowledge of sin. Knowledge of the work of the Holy Spirit. And the list is endless because knowledge, as someone said, is the way of love. This is not just, oh, we heard a message on love, so let's hug each other and love each other and send a couple of cards, and then a week later it all stops. That's not really this love that Paul is talking about. This is a love. Uh, knowledge is a way of love. means it's undergirded by knowledge, by instructions from the Word of God. But that's not enough. Paul continues. He said, and all, what's the word? Discernment, discernment. This is no sloppy agape. <laughs> this is no uh, lovey-dovey Christianity, sentimental faith. There is a sense of discernment. The word there for discernment is found many times in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs. What is the book of Proverbs for? Help you make right decisions in life, skillful living. Making the right judgment calls in difficult situations. How do, you, how do you navigate through confrontation? How do you navigate through conflicts? How do you navigate through better and best? Uh, this, Paul says, I'm praying that you will have discernment. He doesn't stop there. Go on to verse 10. That you may approve the things that are Excellent. I don't have time to go through all the details, but they're all connected. What Paul is saying is that I'm praying that you will choose what matters. You would choose what is excellent. Pray for each other in the body of Christ. Hey, by the way, this prayer can be prayed for your husband, for your wife, for your children, for your family. You're praying, God, don't just let them settle for someone. Let them find the best that you have for that life. How many of y'all say, oh, I, I just want my child to find someone good enough? He said, well, I want them to find somebody who's the best. It's a very convicting message, I'm telling you, because as I was <laughs> preparing on this, I said, God, uh, there are times that I have seen people mess up in our church, to mess up in their marriages, mess up in their home life uh, with their children. The children have done crazy stuff. And I always blame myself. And, and I have people tell me, it's like, don't blame yourself. It's not your fault. People have choices. They have decisions. They have will. And I tell them, no, but as a shepherd, did I really pray for discernment? Did I pray God give them a sense of discernment, how to choose the better and the best? Ministry leaders, this is on you. For too long, we've said it's not my fault. This is on you. This is on me. He doesn't stop there. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, which means this, when you choose what is right, what is excellent, you will be pure and blameless, means you will stay away from sin, you will stay away from temptation, and you will walk pure and blameless until the day of Jesus Christ, helping God finish the work. He will finish the work, but you can stall the work. It will be finished, but you can get in the way. And by the way, this is something you need to pray for our church. Church is growing, great things are happening, but as someone said, another level, another devil. Pray. Are you? I know we're all excited about the new building and new this and new that. Are you praying, God, now the enemy is even more active to corrupt and blame 
I'm praying, God, that you would keep us pure and blameless. He's still not done. Verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus. Fruits of righteousness, meaning right conduct, righteous behavior. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. What are the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Paul is saying, I'm praying that God will bring out those things in your life. I think Paul was also laying down the model of pray for me this way. <laughs> Still not through. Fruit of righteousness. Here comes that verse again. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. Now listen. To the glory and praise of God means ultimately the lives of the Philippians should glorify and praise God. You know, when I end the prayer, many of you all just go, mm, you know. You should be saying amen. You know what amen means? It means I agree. We agree. We agree. You're, you're, you're almost sending that prayer back towards me and then towards God. So we agree that it will happen in your life and in our lives to God. Wow. You know, when you truly understand the depth and detail of Paul's prayer, you understand how much he was a man of prayer. How much his life depended and moved on prayer. And how much he truly prayed for his partners in the faith. Why did he pray so much for them? Because he loved them. Why did he love them so much? Because they were partners with him in the gospel. So what did he do? He encouraged them. He reminded them that God is going to finish what he has started in their lives. He, he told them that he is loving them, not through his love, but through the love of Jesus Christ. How rich, how deep it is. This morning, on that scale, where do you stand? Are you partners in the gospel? Do you love people this way? I mean, I find myself in the negatives. Are you saved? You know, before you can be a partner, you have to be a recipient. You have to receive the grace of God. You have to have Jesus in your life before you can join hands with others. This morning you need to give your life to Jesus Christ and receive that gospel of grace. You come. In a few moments we will have the invitation time. God is calling you. You may want to come and pray. Pray for your family. Pray for your church family. Pray for your Sunday school class. Pray for your care group. Pray for those who work with you in this ministry, whether it's nursery or Kindle or Joy Ministry, Awana, Blaze. I mean, there's so many ministries. You say, well, they're doing this and they're doing that, and I don't approve of this, and I don't approve. Uh, what are you doing? Well, how are you being that stopgap that's keeping them from doing those things? Are you praying for them? Am I?